Uh, again, my name is Paul Mateo. <clears throat> I'm Vice President for Analytical Services with GGNA, um, or my Travoltaized name, which is, uh, I think, Paige Mazim. <laughs> Do any of you guys follow the Oscars? Um, I want to uh, uh, first uh, start out by thanking uh, the Drive Planning Committee, Chris Sorensen, Machiko Gaston, uh, and others for uh, inviting me here again this year and allowing me to present to you <coughs> today. Uh, I'd like to share with you uh, today some uh, several key observations that I've been able to make uh, at my time at GGNA uh, around the topic of uh, prospect screening and how institutions may not be taking full advantage of the data uh, that is brought in from this st strategic investment and some of the uh, processes that happen around that, um, that topic. Uh, I'd also like to try and share some practical advice. Um, hopefully it'll be uh, helpful for some of the institutions, both large and small, um, in uh, the way of those of you who are uh, either considering uh, a screening uh, investment in the midst of or, or have uh, recently completed a screening project uh, with uh, a screening vendor or have done this somehow internally yourselves. Um, just a show of hands in the room, how many of you uh, are considering a screening uh, with an external vendor at this time? Several. Um, and of those of you, have you done screening in the, in the past and have administered them? Yes. <clears throat> and then how many of you uh, are in the middle of it at the moment? and have some challenges and struggles there. Uh, and then any completed recently? And Great, wonderful. <laughs> okay, great. <clears throat> well, let's get right to it. Just uh, a little bit about GGNA. We're a global philanthropic management consulting firm. We have offices in Chicago, where I am based, uh, as well as in London in the United Kingdom. Um, we provide uh, strategic counsel, uh, and some of our services include things like strategic planning studies or feasibility studies. Uh, development program reviews. We also have practice areas in alumni relations, communications, uh, advancement services. Um, uh, 30 of the uh, 61 current billion dollar uh, campaigns are actually clients of ours. We've provided counsel in some form or another to at least 52 of them in the past. Uh, I sit within the analytics division. Uh, we provide prospect analysis, uh, benchmarking, uh, reporting and visualization, as well as some IT and technology solutions to our clients uh, that really serve as a basis for some of the recommendations we make as consultants and really drive um, our recommendations there. Uh, for full disclosure, we are also a prospect screening vendor. Uh, GG&A uh, uh, pioneered this uh, in, in 1986. We have a product called DonorScape, which has taken many names and forms over the years. You might recall Prospect Builder back in uh, the late 90s, uh, and we've rebranded as, uh, as DonorScape since uh, 2006. Um, so I hope that some of my uh, views and perspectives here are really from a consulting standpoint with the experience that, we've, uh, that I've gathered from clients and not as a screening vendor, so uh, feel free to call me out if I am sounding too biased at some of my recommendations. Um, so sort of the premise around uh, our, the fundraising landscape, obviously development budgets are static. Uh, or shrinking in many cases. Um, we're really pressured to generate more dollars, more productivity out of the same resources, even though statistics from Giving USA say that fundraising is at uh, their highest levels. Um, and around our programs, we have these structures. In major gifts, we've got gift officer portfolios. Uh, in annual giving and membership, we have uh, churn rates to deal with. Um, participation rates to deal with, gift planning too. They're, they're starving for prospects. They want to be able to get ahead of some of the bequest intentions that have come in over the transom. And really, all of these programs and structures that we have in place really need a sustainable pipeline of prospects to feed them, to fuel them. Um, and as uh, you guys have demonstrated, uh, many nonprofits across the country are in various stages of some, for some form of screening. Um, the challenges that you face, I, I'm listing here, things like budget justification, um, getting folks to buy into this. You have a tremendous amount of data, um, and yet only a few people in the development office may care or know about it. Um, there's some compliance issues. How do we get people uh, to say it's okay to receive this kind of data or send out this kind of data to external vendors and use it? 
Um, there's obviously some project management issues. These things fall off the rails all, all too easily. Um, and then how do we deploy resources and, and really effectively disseminate all of this information that we've spent so much money on? So truly, it's a major investment in time and in dollars. Um, you know, the screening cost itself with an external vendor can be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but that pales in comparison to all of the investment that we, all of you in the room, make to make this happen and to make this useful. So uh, at the end of the day, what, what really is the ROI when we do um, projects like this? Um, so a couple of good reasons why you'd want to do, uh, undertake this, this process or this project, and that would be, you know, obviously the most obvious, let's identify new prospects, um, those that we've never known before. Um, even looking at prospects that we do know, those that are in gift officer portfolios, things that, prospects that we call top prospects, can we learn more about them through a screening uh, endeavor? And then maybe some of your goals might be to uh, figure out how to deploy fundraising resources for very large and sophisticated, complex organizations. Where do we deploy gift officers, leadership annual giving staff? Where do the pockets of opportunities sort of exist? Um, and then getting sort of more advanced and into how this really generates ROI, we want to talk about the improved transparency of um, those prospects that are entrusted to gift staff, gift officers, uh, leadership annual giving um, uh, officers, uh, who are in their portfolios and are they managing them uh, to their, their highest potential. Um, and then uh, obviously, some of the things that are, are uh, missed in this process is how, how can we use this data to drive and forecast fundraising results? Um, you know, in, in some of the feasibility study work that, that has been traditionally done, we've always looked at the top 100 or the top 300 prospects to an institution and try and extrapolate what we learn from them in terms of a, a campaign goal. But what about all of this data that we learn at the detailed level of prospects? While it's somewhat unreliable, could we use what is reliable out of that data to forecast fundraising results. Um, after a delivery that I do uh, for prospect screening, clients always come up to me and say, wow, there's just so much untapped potential in our database. Um, and this is great, this is gonna change our lives. But then there are a lot of negatives that I hear maybe you know, three months or six months down the line. You know, maybe these resonate with some of you. Well, we just spent what we had in the budget and we, we got something out of it. Um, or even worse, we can't trust the data. You know, we found a, a number of people that were um, rated too high or rated too low, and, and this is our president. He was rated at $10,000. <laughs> um, we didn't get what we expected. It took too long. Um, the gift officers really just ignore the ratings, no matter how hard I try to um, institutionalize this. And then it's too much data. Screening vendors, we want to give so much data back to you and demonstrate value with, uh, around that data. But then we also have that byproduct of um, you know, paralyzing you with all of that data as well. So that all leads to sort of negative um, ROI. Uh, as far as I've been able to tell, this has been pretty much the traditional trajectory of the screening process, right? There's a little bit of planning that's done. We go through this vendor selection process. We have a selection committee. We throw out a billion RFPs. Uh, we invite the vendors to uh, present. We submit the data through you know, whatever means we can. We talk about um, selection criteria. We talk about what data is clean, what data is good. Um, then the screening process, and there's this giant sort of gaping hole, and, and you know, there's nothing said or talked about <laughs> in that process uh, where the vendor takes the data and, and does their magic with it. Um, then the results are delivered, we verify the data, and then we disseminate it. Sounds pretty simple enough, right? Well, the problem with this model is that it's a linear model. You start at the top, and then you go through that process, and then one and done. Well, that's not really how it should be. Um, and I would argue today that really screening, and I'm not the first to say this, is really a cyclical process. Um, and it should be done, repeat, it should be a repeatable process, uh, it should be something that can be um, sort of institutionalized and part of your day-to-day -day, uh, activities at your uh, development organizations. And I'm just gonna touch on today, in each of these um, five areas, uh, some of the deficiencies or opportunities that might exist in each of those areas um, in the cyclical screening process uh, today. Any questions so far? 
Um, so some observations around expectations. So uh, first, actually I have some notes here, I apologize. Uh, screening is one and done, and I, I mentioned that earlier. That's um, something that people say, well, we'll do it every three to five years or when there are dollars in the budget. Um, institutions always have some sort of sky-high uh, level of expectation. So this is going to find us a ton of money, um, but without being able to really define and enumerate what kind of things happen after you do the screening. Um, immediate ROI, that's another uh, expectation that um, we'll be able to raise so much more money after we do a screening and uncover all of these great prospects. Well, that's, that's um, sort of irresponsible because a lot of the work that really happens to raise the dollars hap uh, comes from the frontline fundraisers. Um, and then fourth, uh, the burden is on the vendor. Uh, it's on them to prove that we have prospects in the database. It's them to prove that there really is wealth there. Uh, but in reality, the majority, I'd say upwards of 90%, really do fall with everyone here uh, in this room. And then lastly, we have a fixed budget. Somebody makes up a number and says, $15,000, I'm going to spend that and I'm going to get uh, a great product. Um, so uh, on those observations, um, sort of before you screen, um, you want to be able to define the goals uh, of, of what success sort of means at your institution. Maybe it's you have a new AVP, you have a new VP, uh, new president, new leadership. They want to get, get a sense of what the universe of prospects sort of looks like. So can we do a screening and just take the pulse of, of our prospect pool? Maybe you want to uh, reevaluate the portfolios that uh, exist among gift staff, be it major giving, planned giving, or annual giving. Um, and you suspect that somehow there's some sort of um, imbalance there or that uh, there are prospects in those pools and they don't believe there's equity among those pools. Maybe you want to create clear goals for each of your prospects, I mean, each of your gift staffs. You want to be able to say that um, they'll be able to achieve the following results with the prospects that have been entrusted to them. Um, and finally, maybe you want to make the case for investment. You believe that there's an overwhelming number of prospects and opportunities that exist in the database, and you need to be able to quantify what kind of staff is needed, um, or, or finally, how much feasibility or what kind of feasibility exists to raise uh, money in an upcoming or planned campaign. Um, so at this point, you really want to start beginning to think about uh, metrics and measures. This is not something that you do after the screening. Um, this is something that you, you, you do right away. So I'll give you more on that, uh, on metrics and, and measures in, in just a second. And this really illustrates sort of um, that as a, as a preview, which is uh, this data was collected from uh, some of the top higher ed uh, public and private research universities around the country. Just a quick pulse of how many prospects were assigned uh, to them as managed prospects per FTE. Most of these are full-time FTEs, so 90% FTE dedicated to um, working with and cultivating prospects. And I, I'm, I'm frankly shocked at the, the, um, the wide range of the number of prospects per FTE assigned to some of these places. This institution only has 61 prospects per, um, uh, per FTE, whereas Institution A has almost 205. Um, and Lo and behold, these institutions all raise right around the same amount of money, between 200 and 400, 000, uh, 400 million dollars a year. So does it matter? Um, does, does, uh, prospect, do prospect assignments and their, their load impact how much money they're really able to raise? So we want to start thinking about that as we go through um, this screening process. Um, before you screen, obviously, it's, I, I think it's very obvious that you um, you know, want to create as much buy-in and as much involvement of all of the key advancement or development staffs as possible. Um, and so these are some of the, um, yeah, I'm listing here some of the key uh, segments. And, and I put in bold fundraisers. Uh, because I came, I, I too often come across clients that say, you know, this is a really critical strategic investment for us. Um, we uh, are, are betting on this to sort of, um, you know, uh, formulate our campaign. Uh, this is going to be so important to us. The, the price of the, the screening is really a major gift to our institution, and that's how, much, how valuable it is to us. 
And then when I conduct what we call a technical call, which is where we collect the data from the institution and figure out what their definitions and what their issues with the data are, they say, um, here's uh, Joan. She's a, a retired a part-time consultant for us. She worked with us 10 years ago, and she's going to be your primary contact for this, <laughs> this screening endeavor. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, will you and be involved? No, no, and ask her all of the questions you need, and then call us when it's done. Um, obviously, involve the CDO uh, and the CAO and the leadership, whether it's the academic leadership, involve people from uh, alumni relations if you have that uh, structure, uh, membership if, in academic medicine, certainly clinical uh, uh, folks, clinical leadership. And then ideally, budget is really a secondary um, consideration. Uh, some observations on uh, the external data process. So this is when you actually go out and buy data. And um, what I've seen uh, in my 10 years uh, has been that um, there's a lot of cherry picking. That's kind of the, the top priority is when we say, well, don't you want to screen every prospect in your database? Don't you want to uncover, really do mining? Um, but some of this might be budget driven or immediate need driven, and that's okay, so long as this is a cyclical process and we're trying as much as possible to cover um, the, uh, the playing field. But there is, of course, artificial selection criteria. Well, we only want to screen alumni, or we want to uh, screen people who've given $100 or more in the last year, or $5,000 or more in the last year. Be careful with the, the artificial uh, criteria, especially if you're trying to make the biggest impact out of this project. Um, Mixing constituencies. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are in the uh, higher ed space, but uh, even in the higher ed space, uh, there are parents, there are patients. Mixing all of them together in a screening process for wealth screening is okay, but for a uh, predictive modeling project where you're trying to predict uh, behavior, Mixing those constituencies may not be the right thing. Mixing in uh, incoming freshman parents, patients with this entire modeling process is not going to yield the kind of results that you might be expecting. Um, and then certainly constituencies with um, a constant influx, patients and parents, those should be treated differently. You might want to consider something more like a frequent screening or a recurring screening. Um, some of the examples of that today are grateful patient screening, where people are doing this on a daily, uh, weekly, or monthly basis. Um, your data. Um, perfect is the enemy of um, good. Uh, I, I hear folks a lot when they're about to do this uh, will say, I need to delay. Uh, um, we need to clean up our database. And then in the selection uh, process uh, for a particular vendor, if you're doing this externally, uh, I hear a lot, well, they have maps. That's why we chose them over, over you. <laughs> or they have an iPad app. Um, they also say, I want all of the data, even though they might not have um, all of the intention of using it or, or prepared um, to use it. So some best practices around the external data. First, um, I would encourage you, if you have the budget and have the opportunity, to complete a comprehensive analysis on all living individuals. Ask yourself, why am I not doing this? What, why would I not? Um, obviously, there will be some external constituencies that um, you know, don't make sense to screen, and, and uh, I'm not suggesting that everyone be screened. Um, consider all individual sources, including non-natural or auxiliary constituencies, and as it relates to exclusions, the fewer the better. So do not contact, do not solicit is a great example. If a prospect is tagged as that, we, we usually never see those being screened. But those DNS, DNC codes, how are those, are, are those actually still valid today? When was the last time we looked at those records to see if they're valid and, and why and who put those records or those tags um, on, on those records. Um, don't let data quality slow you down, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Use data cleansing and data pens. Almost all of the top screening uh, vendors will offer this in some form. It'll be like an NCOA, National Change of Address, so we can enhance and and uh, get the updated addresses on your constituents. You can use services like Alumni Finder. There are literally do dozens of companies that do this and try and enhance the quality of your data before you do it, and they can do it really in one shot. Uh, data appends, too, are also valuable. Things like dates of birth, if you have information management issues. Um, age, uh, you know, a, a lot of demographics like gender and marital status, all of these can really be purchased at pennies per record. 
Um, so uh, take advantage of that when you're doing the screening. Don't evaluate the vendors by features and functions. Really focus on the data. Um, the whiz -bang features, like I mentioned, maps aren't um, you know, very important. Uh, I mean, how many times do you look at a map, really? <laughs> Um, and customer service is key. So when you have a question after the screening, can the vendor really pick up the phone and say, this is what this data means. Uh, whether it's, it's good news or bad news, you want to be able to know uh, at your fingertips uh, by picking up the phone or, or sending an email uh, that the data, uh, that there's somebody that will answer your questions about the data. At a minimum, when you, I'm not going to talk about what the strengths and weaknesses of different vendors are, given that I'm one, <laughs> but uh, at a minimum, the, the projects should produce at least two things. One is some sort of major giving capacity or overall wealth. There are different definitions for that, a five-year giving capacity, a one-year giving capacity, uh, but it should be based on hard assets, some evidence that your researchers can use to say, this is why we think this person can give X. Um, and then uh, what would also be helpful is uh, some data around near-term affinity or propensity, because all of that wealth data can be paralyzing. How can we narrow the universe with yet another dimension um, of propensity or likelihood to give or strength of relationship? You can actually do this yourself. Um, depending on how sophisticated you are, how, how comfortable you are with it, you can create measures of, uh, of affinity and propensity yourself, something as simple as total dollars given. Um, and there have been other presentations today uh, and um, in previous drive conferences that have talked about things like alumni engagement and how to do your own scoring there. So don't think that you necessarily need to um, have an external vendor do it. So this is an example of what we produce, but what many uh, screening vendors also produce after a screening, which is really an enumeration of um, all of the prospects that exist by a particular capacity level. They usually have it by some sort of confidence level where on the right-hand side, that's a calculation based on the, the tightest match, um, the most conservative uh, without looking at uh, you know, things like false positives and, and other issues there. And then on the left-hand side, um, the, the loosest type of matching when we uh, take the data. Um, and you'll want to start small, right? You'll want to focus on something in between, not too conservative, not too aggressive. We at GGNA call these the exact and near levels, and that'll really um, be a, a recommended starting point. Um, in terms of predictive modeling or, or affinity ratings, likelihood, propensity to give, um, different companies have different ways of explaining it, but really there's another scoring system, another rating system that describes really how strong the prospects are affiliated with your organization independent of their wealth. Uh, you'll see in this case, I, I realize it's a little small, but an A-rated prospect is your best prospect. A, B, and C are, are in fact your best prospects. Ds and Es are a little bit further away. They're either you know, non-donors or have given very little to the institution, don't really have things like relationships or event attendance uh, associated or affiliated with them. And you'll start to see opportunities that exist there. Out of the A-rated prospects, their average annual giving at this example institution was almost half a million dollars and the uh, average largest gift from each of the, their do those donors were about $61,000. Yet, only 88.7% of them have given in the last five fiscal years. And there might be reasons for that, but um, this is what um, you know, the screening should uncover for you. Um, shift, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I'd like to talk about some critical observations in the results uh, and, and how you verify and integrate this data. Um, first, where is the data? <laughs> uh, is it under lock and key? Is it in this path? Does that path look familiar to you guys? Development, projects, screening, results, <laughs> results.xls. Um, other comments that I've been, other observations that I've been able to make, uh, I was here, it'll take years to verify all of this data. Um, or, you know, let's step aside from the development office and, and talk about who gets access to this data. Um, or another comment is, well, the researcher will pull X, Y, Z. Has, has any of you, have any of you heard some of those comments at your institutions? Um, so some uh, best practices around this. Uh, first, uh, load the ratings and the information management data that you acquire, things like addresses, date of birth, things like that, into the database. There, there really shouldn't be a delay in that. Don't be afraid of verification, the fact that this is raw data. Explain to fundraisers and to staff 
uh, what you've done and, and how you've done it. By doing that, we really take the, the screening results uh, and mobilize it. Why? Because you're now able to integrate this data with the biodemographic data that you have, the giving and relationship data that you have, um, and then very critically, the prospect management and assignment data that you have, um, which hopefully many of you do. Don't go overboard. Um, with a California institution recently, they asked me for our entire data dictionary and they spent six months importing every piece of information that was gathered from the wealth screening process. Things like charitable contributions, um, contributions to federal election campaigns, um, a whole host of information. Um, and after they refreshed the prospect, maybe 50% of that <laughs> stuff had changed. So don't go overboard with that. Um, in terms of uh, research verification, that can certainly be a daunting task, especially for your researchers. Um, but don't panic. Make this um, manageable. Develop a planning and timing for uh, qualifying and verifying these uh, key segments. Anyone in this room have statistics for me on how, how uh, quickly, how long it takes to verify a single prospect at your institutions? Ben? Sure, and it, it's going to vary um, because of how much depth um, somebody's going to take at actually looking at all of this data and Googling and going through all of the other resources. But the idea is, um, you know, perfect versus good. Is this a prospect or not? Is this a prospect remotely in the area that the uh, screening vendor has, has suggested? Um, and we're not doing full profiles, right? Not, not at this stage. Avoid uh, what I call BYOB in this area, which is bring your own bottleneck. Limiting staff access for some reason, creating some embargoed lists. Well, you know, the $100,000 prospects are just going to go to the uh, principal gifts team, and, and only they get to see that data. And then no one really gets to see that data and, and use it uh, effectively. And then really, you want to institutionalize as much as you can. Provide training, provide materials, cheat sheets. Um, MGOs should know the jargon. They should know if they're using the GGNA data, what a major gift code is. If they're using the Blackbaud data, what a target score is. Uh, if they're using the Wealth Engine data, wh whatever vendor. <clears throat> the, the next step after uh, data integration and, and verification validation is really segmentation and analysis. And the screening vendor will do some of this for you to really validate their results and, and get you guys excited. But in reality, that um, on an ongoing basis falls to each and every one of you in this room and, and various members of the development team. Um, and the ways you want to do that, uh, at least at a minimum uh, for me, are around prospect management data, the assignment, moves, which means stages. We want to be able to integrate where the value of each of your capacity uh, prospects are, those the prospects' capacity along the prospect development stage, uh, set of stages. <clears throat> Giving history, uh, which is obvious, uh, relationships and interests, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then, of course, geography, if you have any sort of regional-based programs. Um, for larger organizations, those of you who um, you know, have very specific areas for giving, you want to develop some uh, guidelines or some decision trees or even choose to update them if you already have them around pairing the right prospects with the right staff. So is this uh, in higher education? It's going to be what, where have they uh, earned a degree or multiple degrees? Uh, where have they given in the past? Uh, where do their interests lie? Do they have an affiliation with uh, the medical center or the hospital? Um, and then using inclination ratings and capacity estimates, uh, you might want to start thinking about assigning values to prospect portfolios. And I'll talk about why that's important in just a second. So once the data is in the database and we have prospect management data at our disposal, we can use a tool maybe like Tableau, which is what we've done here, and kind of map out the, the playing field. You know, I've got 657,000 prospects in my universe. This is really everyone, alums and non-alums. I can quickly see, well, there are clearly, uh, you know, about a fifth of my prospects that are under management that at least from an electronic screening standpoint don't really fit the bill. 
Um, and then we also see among the unmanaged pool, wow, there's a tremendous amount of potential, and that can really scare people, especially when you get down to <laughs> these levels where the numbers get very large. But it, it describes what the opportunities are. It describes um, you know, what the playing field is, and it really is an example of the beginnings of how to make this data really actionable. <clears throat> Uh, I talked about pairing the right prospects with um, the right staff, and uh, even at major uh, research universities, we find that they have no guidelines or no decision trees around, um, if they're not managed by a gift officer, who gets to manage them? So this is some criteria that we help the client develop, and it's really simplistic if you look at it, uh, which is what unit area school, where they gave the most dollars in the last five years, um, and if that was a, a tie or, or sort of insignificant, where had they given in their lifetime? Um, where, if they're a parent, was there a, uh, uh, where do their children uh, go to school? Uh, what unit or, or school their children are earning their degree in? Um, athletics, um, some sort of mechanism uh, to uh, decide that. And this should be done before the screening um, gets back to you, to you from the screening vendor. Um, everyone should agree on this process. It should be published. Um, and if there is some sort of debate or, uh, um, you know, we, uh, you want to contest where, where the computerized model says uh, the prospect should go, there should be some sort of appeal process, and that's okay, too. When you've done that, you really now expand on that earlier chart of the assigned and unassigned uh, prospect pool, that basic chart, into now, if you're a very complex organization, units. Uh, for example, I'm looking at Unit B. There are 193 prospects there. Uh, the average value, and we've assigned some sort of proprietary um, formula for calculating capacity and likelihood to give, to give us a value of $2.1,000 per prospect in, in Unit B. Um, and, and see that against the 317 prospects that have been uncovered. These are prospects that have given to this unit, prospects that have earned degrees from that unit potentially, um, and there's so much opportunity from a, a average prospect value that each of those prospects on average, when evaluated by the same criteria that we've done on the left-hand side of low priority prospects, high priority prospects that are unmanaged at $105,000 per prospect. Um, similarly for unit I, where there are 23 prospects there with an average value of 1.1 thousand. This might actually, to me, look like a, um, uh, a uh, uh, annual, giving, um, or annual giving portfolio. Actually, I was misspeaking, I'm sorry. The left-hand side is the prospects that are under management today that are high priority. The low priority, the middle column, are the prospects that are also under management who don't appear to um, have the, the wealth and the uh, uh, affinity to give. So could we replace those 193 with the 317? Could we replace 23 with the 215? That's a, a fun exercise. That's something fun that, that each of you would, would love to do with uh, these unit managers. <clears throat> and then uh, I, I had to put an example here on, on how this is applicable to annual giving. Um, this is just a simple analysis that looks at a rated annual giving level, um, those who are donors, those who have do, uh, given in the, in the blue box, 100% of the donors who have uh, been rated as $5,000, $2,500, and $1,000 have given in their lifetime, yet there is a gap. Only 72% are recent donors. Only 66% of the $2,500 to $5,000 donors are recent donors. And then of the $1,000 to $2,500, only 55% of them are recent donors. So that can be um, another exciting data point and a, another way of segmenting uh, prospects for your annual gifts uh, and leadership annual giving team. <clears throat> so some actions. Um, if this is your first screening, uh, present the findings to all the stakeholders and leadership. I've done uh, a lot of work with uh, deans, academic deans, um, providers and physicians to get them to know what exactly we're doing. You want to be able to describe and really define how we're going to use this data. Um, you know, at, at Kansas, um, uh, Mark Wilson there made a, a very clear statement that this is how we evaluate portfolios. We're not using other, um, you know, gut instincts. It has to, you know, fall into, at least for unmanaged prospects, 
um, ratings that have been externally validated, um, provide training, and then also consider consulting services, uh, not necessarily from gg and <laughs> but anyone, um, to help affect culture change. Um, when it's said from within the research department or prospect development department, it may not have as strong of a message as when it's coming externally, um, and they, can, uh, they usually should provide a very non-biased third-party assessment um, that'll get uh, the development team um, believing in this, this process. The research staff should really be focused on um, confirming those uh, unassigned high-value prospects. If you have new staff with no portfolios or, or um, you know, need to build portfolios for those staffs, delay decisions about um, how to uh, deploy those resources until we clean up some of the prospects that are already being managed, right? We want to start filling portfolios until we get a, a sense of what a good portfolio looks like. Um, try as best as possible to, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, evaluate the assignments against their FTE status. Um, and then distribute a list of currently assigned prospects with the inclination ratings, capacity ratings. This is the homework. Get them to review their portfolio um, and see if they can clean out any outdated uh, assignments. So in terms of how this might apply with staffing, this is a great example. It's a really simple one. This uh, development office only has about six fundraisers. They say they have 1,000 prospects. Uh, we've been able, at least we've been able to identify that they have about 1,000 prospects under management. We found that maybe 279 of them don't exactly fit the bill. We haven't verified it, but we've suggested that that might be the possibility. We've uncovered another 428 prospects, uh, at least for the principal major and uh, plan giving uh, FTEs that could be put into portfolios at the qualification stage. And when we look at that in total, the prospect load, if we remove the 279, is about 1,200 prospects. And if we assume that maybe the prospect load is appropriate at 150, maybe 120, maybe even as low as 60 as we saw earlier, 60 prospects per FTE, we can start to see what kind of staffs are really needed to manage these prospects. And at the major giving level, we've assumed that we're gonna try and go after 100% of the high value prospects. Well, for leadership annual giving, there was an overwhelming amount. There was almost uh, 10 times the number of prospects that really existed there. Um, and so we estimated it at 10%. So that gives them something to do this year. That gives them something to do uh, for years to come. <clears throat> if you have stages, which um, you know, with all of the prospect management talk that's been going on at conferences for the last 10 years, um, what you'll hear some uh, guidelines and recommendations around that. Um, you know, review the stages model if you have one. Take this as an opportunity to refine them. Uh, a lot of our, the clients that I see say, well, we have a stages model, but we don't use it. Um, give homework to the gift officers so that they can at least report on the current stage, kind of clean this up. And that might seem like a very daunting or uh, long-term task. Um, I remember an example for a, a Midwest university, fairly large, um, in Nashville that did this in two weeks. They gave gift officers two weeks to uh, spreadsheets of their gift officers and said, just recode these right now, we'll get them into the system. And then uh, this is an opportunity for them to say, well, you know, really, this prospect doesn't really belong in my portfolio. I've been stewarding them for 10 years and nothing's happened. Um, let's either put them in a long-term stewardship stage or really release them to the leadership annual giving or annual giving program. Um, and then at that point, once you've gotten a sense of all of where your prospects sit in the prospect development cycle, this is when you start to begin uh, distributing those unmanaged pools and starting to fill portfolios. You'll get a sense of, well, will 20% of my portfolio be dedicated to qualifying prospects? And that gives that, that, that cyclical piece uh, uh, some validation of the cyclical nature of this process which is I'm gonna move prospects in and out of the qualification stage. I'm gonna qualify them, I'm gonna move them along. If I can't qualify them, I'm gonna remove them from my portfolio and, and work on other prospects. Um, and then finally, and really most importantly, um, report and measure. Uh, it'll be easier to make the case to do this again, to, to invest more dollars with an external vendor, um, to add validity to all of your efforts when you're able to uh, report and measure on what you've just done. So obviously, uh, things like management reports should be available to everyone uh, via the use of Tableau or any tools that you have um, within your development databases. 
um, utilize these types of reports that really put the accountability on the gift officers to say, listen, I gave you 100 prospects to qualify. Maybe that's too high. <laughs> I gave you 50 prospects to qualify, and what'd you do with them? The qualification stage, how much time do you want to give them to do that? A month, three months for a particular prospect? Maybe it's three weeks. Tell them, listen, I, I won't give you any more prospects, or I can't give you any more prospects until you look at these. Um, and then finally, uh, as it relates to measures, these are the following management questions you want to ask. Are staffs really configured to match, maximize the opportunities? Are the portfolios balanced? Have we changed the quality of the portfolios, even though they look um, sort of balanced? Do we have prospects that are going to represent near-term benefit for the institution? And then have we been successful at getting donors to give at their capacity? And just, uh, I just want to share a few slides before I uh, uh, open it up for questions. This is a portfolio analysis view. Um, these are fake names uh, here. Uh, I'm looking at, that's probably a principal gift portfolio with 16 prospects representing about $35 million worth of value. Um, but then I want to look at Caesar Flickerman and Alex Ruzenko, who both have 86 prospects in their portfolio. But the value of the prospects in their portfolio are tremendously different. And we might say, uh, you might hear Alex complaining to his, his supervisor that I just don't have the same quality of prospects as Mr. Flickerman. Um, so this will start to allow you to, to rebalance and, and review those. Um, prospects by stage, if you're about to finish a campaign or about to start a campaign, 36% of whatever value you might have in your prospect pool is in stewardship right now. And we're only cultivating or near solicitation for just under 40% of the value or the capacity of prospects. And even fewer in terms of the number of prospects, only 28% of the, the absolute number of prospects are in uh, solicitation or about to be solicited. And then begin to look at that if you're a complex organization with a number of units, who's lagging behind, who's leading. Um, who's being effective at moving prospects through that pipeline. Um, so the impact of all of this, you know, uh, we started at, at screening and, and now we're into portfolios and, and, and things like that. This is an example from Yale, a project we did uh, about three, four years ago. They had 97 prospects under management. They had 31 prospects, uh, 9,700 9, prospects under management representing almost $1.6 billion of value. And again, the number is not so important, but the fact that we have a number is important. There were 3,200 uh, who were low priority assigned prospects, prospects in portfolios. And then when you subtract that number, you get about 6,500 if you were just, um, you know, go out boldly and shed those prospects. Yet we had another 1,500 prospects um, who were high priority unassigned prospects. In terms of value, they represented uh, almost $120 million compared to the low priority who represented only $9.4 million. And in the end, when we shuffled all of these things around, we now manage 1,500 fewer, 1,600 fewer prospects. We now manage $110 million more worth of value. And the average value of the prospects has increased from 165 million um, $1,000 per prospect to $243,000 um, in pro um, prospect value. And then now how do we measure sort of ROI? And it's difficult, very, very difficult to measure ROI. A client said, well, if I'm spending $50,000 with, with you, um, how much value am I going to get out of it? I saw a statistic out there. I don't know who put it out there. It's, a, you know, you get 400% ROI. I don't believe in that number because it's very difficult to measure that just on the screening component of this work alone. You know, you got to look at the whole life cycle. But this really starts to point at ROI. This is donor penetration rates for a law school, um, both public, a few, a couple of publics and, and mostly private institutions, similar alumni sizes. We looked at the penetration rate of donors among their alumni pool, which is a natural constituency. And for institution A, for ever donors, it was 45%. For institution C, it was 74%. But when we looked at only the high capacity uh, alumni, these are alumni who have given, uh, who have capacity, I'm sorry, of $25,000 or more or $100,000 or more, choose your measure. It happened to be very, very different. I would be very envious of institution C if I were institution A to see that they've been able to penetrate 31% of their pool uh, of high, uh, high capacity alumni. 
um, versus the 4.5 that I'm currently uh, um, enjoying. Um, so when you've completed this analysis, uh, this, this process of screening and, and uh, deploying them to major gift officers and leadership annual giving staff, you should see those numbers of donor penetration above 1,000 and 10,000 really increase. And that's, that, I believe, is, is the indicator of, um, of ROI. So uh, in, in closing, before I take questions, you know, will we raise more money? Um, maybe. <laughs> if, if the fundraisers do uh, their jobs, which they're, they're very good at doing. Um, the critical intelligence is widely available. We have buy-in from all levels of the institution. They know exactly what we're trying to do and what, we're, uh, what our goals are. We have better management. There are regular meetings with the, the managers and gift uh, officers on each prospect that exists in their portfolio and why they should be there. And then in reality, our universe is now narrowed. We've taken 680,000 records in our database and really narrowed them down to manageable um, pieces and chunks. And now we have a, a system for fact fact-based assessments and, and really external validation. So I'm sorry I ran through that too quickly. I wanted to leave some time for some questions, so I'll, I'll take them now if you have them. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, the, um, this one, yes. No, I mean, they're, they're, electronic screening is so, um, I wouldn't say hit or miss, but I would say that you will always find flaws in that data. What I'm say, I think the point of this slide is to suggest you don't want to be too conservative when you're suggesting prospects to be looked at by an individual uh, researcher or, or person. You want to sort of start in the middle. All, you know, screening data, it's, it's not done by, by human, right? And there can be outdated data across the variety of sources done in Bradstreet, LexisNexis. All of them um, have, have bad data contained in them. Um, so uh, this is just a, a place to start. Does that help? OK. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Sure. Right. Two big things. Um, one, uh, someone, uh, I forget her name, published some, um, and it, it isn't updated very often, but it should be, uh, some estimates on real estate valuations across the country. So you can pair that data, if your vendor doesn't do it, um, with the real estate valuations. Most of us go by um, you know, assessed market value, which is always very low. Uh, some of us go by sales value, which might be a little high, depending on how leveraged um, the prospect might be. Even better, you might want to find a vendor that uses something called AVM. It's an automated valuation model. That automated valuation model will account for all of those things. And I won't tell you which vendors those are. Um, it, offline, I will. <laughs> uh, of who will uh, take that data into account. It's, it's, it's expensive, but um, if you're relying on real estate for that could be helpful. Yes? Well, you've already created like that, that requirement. So I, I don't know how, how you can get away from that other than convincing those who have approved this budget uh, that the pockets that they're missing out on are in fact you know, worthy of screening. I mean, if you find one prospect, it makes that case. But if you are confined to that, I would at least recommend that you wealth screen them. So you may not model them. Uh, modeling them in terms of likelihood and propensity, that might be easier for those of uh, those prospects who've never given or those, but at least you want to get even an indicator of what the capacity of the remaining pool is. So as much as possible, make that case for, let's get at least a, a, an indicator of the entire pool, even if it's a, a less premium wealth screening than, than your best prospects. 
Do I have how much time left? Okay, yes. Yes. <laughs> There are really quite a few levels. Um, the best way it's been described to me is you know, what you intend to do with that prospect. So the first one is verification. So does the suggested capacity fit with um, you know, the, the, what the prospect is actually capable of? The next might be a qualification profile. And that might contain a little bit more information to allow the gift officer to go out and see this person and get more information out of them. And then the, the highest level would be a sort of a solicitation profile. And that's got to have everything. That's got to have interest. That's got to have, you know, and each of those are exponentially more time consuming than the other. So if we're just trying to get a lay of the land, I'd say the, the verification profile is all you need. Um, but if, if you're actually going out and soliciting somebody, you're going to need everything under the sun. And, and researchers are very uh, qualified and able to do that. Anything else? Yes? Last, is that the last one? Okay, yeah, last one. So if you have a list of people who are typically, for example, on accommodation, and you classify it as a match, and you don't know whether or not those individuals are actually close enough or alumni, are there any people listed as individuals uh, on accommodation, for example, that can tell you whether or not they're in for alumni? Did, did you say you have lists of prospects who are not? You, you don't know if they're alumni? I see. Um, so, so the question was, if, if we can find alumni, uh, the, the fact that they are alumni from foundation lists that you may have acquired. There are sources for that. Um, one that comes to mind is Marquis Who's Who. They store the data, and it, we provided, and I think uh, two other uh, screening vendors provided as well, biographical data. And it will have XYZ University listed there. The problem with that data is it's very difficult to, to match perfectly. The data that Marquis Who's Who would have would just be a basic name and address and maybe some geography. So that is a, a challenge. Um, hopefully, you do have a record for that individual, and you can screen the name against your own uh, alumni database. Yeah, and we'll check that being done. But then the question is, to confirm that that individual out there in the world would match, you know, the foundation data to an alumni, is that standard usage? It's something a vendor can certainly uh, do. I don't know if they would necessarily do it well. Um, and I may not be ans um, understanding your question completely, but my sense is that if I have an alum who has the following family foundations or private foundations or serves on a public foundation, by screening that record through these vendors, GuideStar, which is a, a, a collection of all the 501c3 and 990s, would be able to uncover the fact that they sit on that on that board or, or, does that help? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Oops.